Dr. Leslin Lewis has seen much success in politics due to her wide appeal across many demographics. A lawyer by trade and currently serving as an MP for an Ontario riding, Lewis has made some powerful statements in the House of Commons. Her campaign's message, hope, unity, and compassion, have resonated with party members across the country. Having won the popular vote and placing third overall in the 2020 leadership race, she is set on doing whatever it takes to ensure young Canadians inherit an even better country than the one we know today, and is running to be the leader of the Conservative Party again this year. Dr. Lewis, thank you for being with us today. We're going to have some good conversation. I'm looking forward to it. Now, I want to dive into, firstly, uh, this issue of the green agenda, oil, gas, farmer's fertilizer, because you've got a master's in environmental studies, and I'm so happy about that because I think the future is going to require uh, some real brilliance in that area. But people, we've got these two sides of these issues. How do you look at some of these things with the green agenda that's pushing against us right now? I'm really happy that I have a master's of environmental studies also because it gives me an opportunity to really look at the issues in detail rather than from a politicized standpoint. And the frustrating thing for me is, is when I see that politicians are using the environment as wedge issues and Mm -hmm. politicizing it and even making it a partisan issue, it's, it's somewhat offensive because the protection of the environment cannot be a partisan issue. It has to be a multi-partisan issue. And we as citizens have to demand that we have some sense of what the metrics are that are used to get to a certain outcome. And we have to demand that that outcome is measurable and that we're seeing real value for these policies. And one example I'll give you is just just how we've used the environment to conjure up fear. And out of that, now we have a carbon tax, which has affected every aspect of your life. When you turn up the heat in your home, the food that you buy um, is increased because of the carbon tax every time you pump gas at the at the pump that's increased because of the carbon tax and yet when we ask questions about how much has the carbon tax reduced emissions carbon emissions there's no answer for it and they cannot quantify it and so for me that's really really objectionable because our entire lives have been changed and yet we are not seeing the benefits in the environment and we care we care about the environment and so we don't want to be used Uh, in order to facilitate a revenue generating policy that's supposed to protect the environment. And it actually is not doing that. That's so true. It's like uh, an economy is really important. We we can't destroy our economy and go backwards. And I tell everybody that we need to look after this planet. It's for our kids and our grandkids. And so we have to be. But once it gets politicized and and people are going to try to make money off of this, it, it just gets crazy. In fact, a lot of the stuff that I'm reading from think tanks and brilliant men and women out there, boy, they disagree a lot with what governments are doing in this area of the green agenda. Yeah, because uh, it the agenda is coupled with other agendas. And so what I'm seeing is that they're using the environment to facilitate other types of agendas like social agendas and economic reform agenda. And it's it's not necessarily focused on solely environmental stewardship, because when we look at people like farmers, farmers have sometimes had their land in in their family for generations and they know optimally how to produce their products. And yet they are often being excluded from the solutions that the government are imposing. And we see the implications of that and the manifestation of those outcomes all around the world now when we've witnessed what's happened in Sri Lanka. And and Sri Lanka is, I think, further along than any other country because that green agenda was was imposed uh, for a longer period of time. And we see what's happening in the Netherlands with, with the farmers there. And it's a simple thing as, as nitrogen reduction, which should be something that you really include farmers on because they know at what point in time in the season to apply nitrogen, to get the best yields, how to reduce right nitrogen content. But what we're seeing is we're seeing government policies that's just based on airy-fairy uh, theories that are, 
are not substantiated. We know that the in atmosphere is made up of 78% nitrogen, 21% oxygen, and 0.04% carbon. And yet our carbon output in Canada, I believe, is about 1.35% of the world's population. And when we asked what our metrics, what our policies, how much it has reduced carbon globally, we don't have an answer for that. So your policies, if they're not measurable, what are they doing? And how are you going to continue to sell it to Canadians that they should substantially transform their lives when you cannot even substantiate how your policies are actually improving the environment. So true. You know, if we're going to be these do-gooders and, uh, and change our entire country, hurt our economy, how are we going to compete in global markets? How are we going to, like, China's not going to do that. Russia's not going to do that. You know, how many countries out there uh, are, will, will let other countries self-destruct? And, you know, that's just me guessing. I'm not an expert on this. Uh, but wow, can we hurt the entire nation if we go down this, continue to go down this road? Would you agree on that? That is one valid point that that other countries do not have the same requirements, and we live in a global environment. And so, even if we reduce our 1.35 percent of carbon emissions to zero, uh, based on the increase that car China has had with their coal plants, it completely negates that. So, really. In fact, we are deluding ourselves when we do not have a harmonized type of global solution. So that's one issue. And then the second issue is even for the policies that we're imposing on Canadian companies, the it, it's such a nonsensical approach because when we look at something like the environmental social governance, ESG, is a new program that's based um, that the international financial reporting standards have created a new accounting regime for small and medium-sized enterprises. And it means that these small and medium-sized uh, businesses have to now track the life cycle of all of their products, every single product that, they, that their service um, generates and that their business generates. And based on that, this is all tied into the futuristic notion that we can track people's carbon footprint and that we can have an economy based on everybody's carbon put footprint. So we measure how much steak you eat, how much um, gas, how far you travel, and you will have allocations as to how much you can output. And that will be based on and tied into your digital identity. And so that's what these, um, this SM, these um, environmental social governance is about. But the funny thing is, is that when Canadian companies, say, go to a place like China, they don't have to subject those companies or those uh, customers to the same type of environmental social governance. So it shows some sort of, um, it some shows a contradiction yeah. in even the way we're treating our own corporations and the policies that we're willing to impose on our own corporations. And we know that a policy like environmental social governance will cripple many small businesses under red tape, more red tape than they have now. And those that will get richer are the lawyers, the accountants, and the consultants, essentially. Wow. When you look at what's happening in the landscape and then and you kind of uh, superimpose that further ahead, it's as though organizations are starting up who are going to be critiquing companies and rating them. And then the public is going to see this and determine whether or not they use these companies, which puts these organizations who... They're the ones who are going to supposedly watchdog everything. It puts them in charge of our economy. Basically, it's putting them in charge of which companies rise up and, and, and keep the line and which ones are pushing back. And not only that, um, to add to that, it also will collapse our local production. Yes. Because um, things can be done at a cheaper level, probably more efficiently in other places. That doesn't mean that the quality is better. But a lot of our local production will, will be collapsed. And it's not just judging the corporations. It's then also having a way, because if they have to track their complete end use, that means that they have to have a mechanism of tracking you also. And it will also change how you, your life, 
uh, unfold as a citizen. So, for example, even in the United States, they have um, in in places like Walgreens, they have uh, fridges that will have uh, digitized ability to open it. And you could say, for example, you have ice cream in one in one freezer and you put in your digital ID and you've had enough too much sugar for the month. That freezer is not going to open. That's what they're planning for the future. And so all of these things are in place. And the average Canadian doesn't know that that's where we're going with the with this digital ID and the digital surveillance and and other things that they're putting in place that really are infringing up upon some of your uh, freedoms and your liberties. That is so true. You know, the um, oil and gas, like the fact that their leaders here in Canada are trying to shut down that industry and then buying it from even worse abusers. Isn't that what's going on? Essentially, well, even if we look at um, what's happening right now in Europe, we will see that we missed out on a great opportunity. Even our LNG, liquefied natural gas, um, our petrol products, we were unable to get it to Tidewater to get it over to the market. And right now in, in Europe, Russia is essentially... Europe is pay, buying 40% of their oil and gas from Russia right now. And we could have, it could, that could have been our products that's over there, but we haven't built pipelines. We don't have the capacity to get our products to Tidewater and over to other markets. And so what we have right now is a situation where we are living in an hypocritical environmental reality yeah. where we have told ourselves that we really care about the environment and we are transitioning to this green economy. We're supporting green technology, yet uh, we are not admitting that we haven't fully transitioned, that we're still in a reality where we're importing over 550,000 barrels of oil every day. And some of that is coming from dictatorship regimes. And yes, with poorer environmental and human rights records than we have right here in this country. And so that paradox, we're not really facing the reality that we are living in a hypocritical environmental reality. Yeah. Let's, let's switch and talk a little bit about mainstream media and government bailouts and the fact that the press, the mainstream media, it, it's not about being fair to both sides. It's about just touting a, down one line. Talk to me about the mainstream media and the bailouts. Um, well, right now I see the media as acting almost like an arm of the, of the liberal government. Yeah. And when you look at something like the trucker convoy, I was there, uh, my apartment when I'm in Ottawa, when I'm not in my riding of Haldeman Norfolk, is just one block away from Parliament. And I walked through that convoy every day. And in fact, other MPs had to walk through it every day. And what was projected on the media was completely and unequivocally untrue. They made it seem like there was an insurrection, there was a takeover of parliament, and that it was fueled by foreigners, and, and there was a Russian imposition. That was all untrue. Walking through there, you, you witnessed b bouncing castles, people sharing, singing, um, yeah. <laughs> uh, praying together, whether they were Sikhs, Muslims, uh, Christians, coming together, sharing, cooking for each other. It was a complete um, misinformation that was projected by our media. And that's just one example of our, us funding, even a, an organization like the CBC, a billion dollars a year, and yet they cannot even uh, dispense proper news Right now, the media is acting like a totalitarian arm of the liberal government. And that's because the liberal government has largely bought out legacy media. And so we do not have an independent legacy media. And we need that in order to have a functioning democracy. And so I think we need a model whereby maybe something similar to Australia, where you have a pool of, of funds and media applies for those funds and they have to demonstrate that they are capable of independent reporting and that they are acting as an independent check on government, not as a propaganda wing of, of one particular party. 
so much of this comes down to leadership. It's like we have to, and I'm, I'm saying this often, it's like we've got to begin to train emerging generations again as to what leadership is. Because so many people think leadership is about your career, where you're going, your finances, your reputation, your influence, rather than leadership is to serve the people. Leadership is to rise up as a leader. And, and we're not seeing that. And people think it's fine. Well, that would have hurt my career. Yeah, but you're in a position of protecting people and raising up a country. I just feel like talking about leadership. Well, I think you're seeing it with me. I've made the decision that I would lay down my reputation, which I fought for very, very hard, having earned a PhD in international law, practicing lawyer, taught at uh, York University, University of Toronto, Osgoode Hall Law School, owned my own business. So I've spent my whole life building my reputation. And I know that there's so many tough issues that I have to talk about with Canadians. And because we have a very compromised, politically compromised mm -hmm. media, I know that their goal will be to ruin my reputation. Yeah. But right now, the most important thing for me is to uphold our sovereignty, which I see is being infringed on by a lot of the global organizations that are imposing, not necessarily imposing their will, but that we have signed on to these treaties and then the they have their tentacles in in different aspects of our social economic and our political system to the point where now we we have had even a leader of a global organization the world economic forum Char klaus schwab state that he has and these are his words that he has penetrated canada's cabinet which is which is very very dangerous because wow. if a global business leader believes that he has penetrated a democratically elected government and and wow. the cabinet that that's very very dangerous mm -hmm. for our democracy and so we do need leaders that are going to be able to lay down what it is 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 their reputation and fight for the country and not really be concerned so much about their political career but making sure that we as Canadians remain Canadian citizens and not global citizens because that is the dream of Justin Trudeau is to make Canada remake Canada into this post-nationalist state, actually. And we as Canadians, we have to fight to make sure that we preserve our way of life, which means that we instill um, pride in, in, in the fact that we are a nation that has made some mistakes. And we have good that we can celebrate and learn from the mistakes that we've made and secure our economy, secure our political system, and se secure our social life, which starts with with the fabric of the family as the cornerstone of society. That is so true. The, uh, when it comes to what's going on in Canada, there, there's a group of people who keeps watching mainstream media. And it's shocking to me when I, I mean, I'll go watch it to see what's going on there, knowing that there's just agenda, 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 agenda. And then I'm so glad, you know, people say, well, years ago, I mean, if you wanted to take over a country, you had to deal with the media, the newspaper, the radio. Uh, but today, uh, with the internet and with all these other groups that are rising up, it's really hard to stop truth from coming out. And it just brings me to my next question in regards to um, C11, Bill C11 and the on Online Streaming Act. Tell me a little bit about that. Are people missing what's going on here? Bill C-11 is an attempt to really not only go beyond um, compelling your speech and your voice, it's actually going inside of your home in, in directing how you sh should think and what is um, truth and what is not truth. So they want to be able to control the algorithms that, that you will see when you punch in search words what will pop up is what they believe and what they deem is truth. Not only that, um, what they deem is Canadian content, which they have not even be, been able to define no. that. They want to basically pick winners and losers and say, this is the type of content that Canadians should be able to view, which is fundamentally wrong because you, you, you even have taken it one step further 
it's not just politicians and news anchors and reporters telling you what to think now. Now this is programmed through artificial intelligence. And so this even taps into our organic nature of being as human beings that we are laying down those rights to an artificial source to tell us what is okay to think and what is okay to watch. It is a fundamental erosion of our freedom of conscience and our freedom of expression and belief. And I think it's a very, very dangerous piece of legislation that uh, if we don't get our hands on making sure, uh, ensuring that, that there are checks and balances in this legislation. Actually, I don't even know that it can be saved because it is just such corrupted piece of legislation that it has no respect for our individuality and our ability to have freedom of thought, which I believe is a fundamental freedom. I've heard people from other countries almost laugh at this and go, who does Canada think they are that they're going to have to deal with the rest of the world one way and then just in Canada? Well, this is what we've done even for immigrating to Canada. Our, our entire freedom and our structure has been so eroded because we have been so afraid of standing up for truth and standing up to a government that bullies and shames people. And look at even the last election, what happened. That election was called days after our prime minister stood up and lied to Canadians. He told Canadians that if they sit beside an unvaccinated person, that they were in danger when he knew very well at that time that the vaccine did not prevent transmission or acquisition of COVID. He knew that the vaccine was, was uh, invented largely to reduce symptoms of COVID and to reduce the stress on the hospitals. He knew that, but yet he stood up in, in front of Canadians and demonized a group of Canadians so he could segregate. And then his hope was to be able to call an election based on that segregation. And he now has a majority coalition with, with the NDP. Yeah. So we are still at risk of this type of divide and demonize and this type of fear politics that Justin Trudeau has really, really um, forced upon this country. And we are looking at this with the Arrive Can app even. The Arrive Can app has quarantined, vaccinated people, kept healthy um, even vaccinated and unvaccinated people in their homes because of glitches. And I believe that this Arrive Can Act is just because they've signed an agreement with the World Economic Forum, known as the Known Traveler Digital ID Program. And that Known Traveler Digital ID Program that they've signed, I believe that the Arrive Can App will somehow evolve into that Known Traveler Digital ID Program. Yeah. So they're not divulging all of their political uh, agenda to the Canadian public. And that's why people are scratching their heads and they're saying, this doesn't make any sense. No other country has this Arrive Can app, and yet they're functioning and screening patients for COVID in a normal manner. Why, Canada, do you have this? Why, Canada, have you enrolled in the Known Traveler Digital ID program with the World Economic Forum? And the leader of that uh, organization has said he's penetrated our cabinet. Wow. You know, when you look at one of the things I was going to ask you was when you look at uh, the controversy in America over the elections there and, you know, sometime in the next whenever there'll, there'll be an election in regards to who's going to be the prime minister. And uh, how confident are you in Canada's uh, election protocols and the security there of having it fair, accurate and nobody tampering with it? Do you have any concerns there? I think the reason that the fact that you have to ask that shows that there is a complete distrust in our institutions. When you have a prime minister who um, a day before he invoked the Emergencies Act was told that things were going to be resolved and the 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 protests at critical infrastructures were resolved and that the mayor of the city of Ottawa told him that things were likely going to be resolved and he immediately went and invoked the Emergencies Act because he wanted to make it seem like he solved this problem. And the brute force that was used against Canadians, this undermines 
the institution of the government, it undermines it. And so that's why you're asking me this question about whether or not we can even trust our voting system, because we've had in the last seven years an erosion of trust based upon the totalitarian and dictatorial approach that Justin Trudeau has taken in governing this top-down approach of talking down to Canadians. Do you know that even now they are trying to um, impose a new uh, regulation that will um, use taxpayers' money to protect uh, members of parliament because they're saying that the members of part of that the, the public are asking so many questions that they feel unsafe. They feel unsafe because they have dismissed all the questions that Canadians have asked um, through answers like that's a conspiracy theory. And so because they have not addressed Canadians' concerns, Canadians continue to ask questions over and over. When the trucker convoy went to Ottawa, what happened? They were called racist. They were called misogynist mm -hmm. instead of their elected officials answering their questions. And now the government wants to use Canadian taxpayers to protect them from Canadian citizens rather than going out in the public and answering these questions. This is madness. This is a complete disintegration of our governmental structure. Yeah, we, it's an interesting that history shows us that weak leaders will always put a lot of layers between them and the people they lead. So they don't ever have to answer questions. They don't have to give account uh, at all. And no, we need access, I mean, in a proper way to leaders. And we need questions answered. That That is for sure. Well, I know that there is a, a race on when it comes to the Conservative Party. And uh, talk to me a little bit about Canada and you know, where what's crucial to, to you if you were to get in as the prime minister one day and have a chance uh, to say we've got to begin to turn Canada in the right direction? Just give me some of your thoughts on what you would do. If you look at my motto of hope, unity, and compassion, um, hope for our country, we need to remain a sovereign nation. And we have a lot of global forces that are infringing mm -hmm. on our sovereignty, whether yes. it's our family structure, our social structure, our economic structure, our viability, our ability to bring our supply chains home, to be self-sustaining, our food supply chain, um, our development of our natural resources. These are all things that we need to make sure that we have local laws that can facilitate a Canada first strategy. We also need to unite our party and our country. And we need to do that by making sure that all voices are heard in our party. That means fiscal conservative, social, uh, libertarian, and progressive conservatives all have to sit around the table and have our voices heard form policies that we can find common ground in uniting um, this country and moving forward. And we also have to move away from the Ottawa knows best approach and listen to every region and the regionally specific needs of every region in this country. And lastly, we need compassion. We need compassion to deal with a lot of the social issues that we are seeing. Mm -hmm. Something is happening in our society and because we have had this cancel culture and wokeism narrative we're not talking about these things and i'd like to come back and talk to you about all of these pressing issues um primarily about canada and and as a sovereign nation i'd love to i think that would be great to dive even deeper into some of these issues for people who like to think and who want to know thank you dr lewis for being with us today thank you so much for having me. it was a pleasure